Thirteen letters in the New Testament claim to be written by the Apostle Paul, but some New Testament scholars like Bart Ehrman say that six of them are blatant forgeries, most notably First and Second Timothy. This puts Christians in an awkward spot, as forgery is, well, just another way to lie, and that does go against the Ninth Commandment. And that's allegedly what we have in our New Testament, one big fat lie about who wrote the pastoral epistles. But if the critics' arguments turn out to be weak sauce, then it's not the New Testament that loses credibility, but its detractors. In his book, Forged, Writing in the Name of God, Why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are, Bart Ehrman lays out three main reasons why he thinks the pastorals are bogus. Granted, there are more arguments out there, but I'm guessing Bart's picking these three because he thinks they're the very strongest. Bart's first complaint comes in the form of vocabulary issues. It is one of the more popular objections to Pauline authorship. There's a difference between what we see in the undisputed letters of Paul and the pastorals. Here's what Ehrman has to say. There are 848 different words used in the pastoral letters. Of that number, 306, over one-third of them, do not occur in any of the other Pauline letters of the New Testament. That's an inordinately high number, especially given the fact that about two-thirds of these 306 words are used by Christian authors living in the second century. This suggests that the author is using a vocabulary that was becoming more common after the days of Paul, and he too therefore lived after Paul. If you don't find this argument too persuasive, I can't say that I blame you. We all use a different range of vocabulary based on our audience. Paul's letter to Timothy was a personal letter Letter written to one of his spiritual sons, unlike most of the other letters which are written to entire congregations. To illustrate from everyday life, I've been a supervisor of a sales team of about 15 people, but the company consisted of thousands of employees. The way that I write to a coworker or one of my employees, or if I'm emailing my entire team, or if I'm writing for the company blog, will greatly vary depending on who my audience is. Even Ehrman himself suggests that this isn't really that strong of an objection against Pauline authorship. Quoting Bart, probably not too much stock should be placed in mere numbers. Everyone, after all, uses different words on different occasions, and most of us have a much richer stock of vocabulary than shows up in any given set of letters we write. Okay, so good on Ehrman for admitting that this isn't a particularly strong argument. Let's see what else he has. Ehrman moves his focus from word statistics to the way words are actually used in the pastorals. Here's Ehrman again. In books such as Romans and Galatians, faith refers to the trust a person has in Christ to bring about salvation through his death. In other words, the term describes a relationship with another. Faith is a trust in Christ. The author of the pastorals also uses the term faith, but here it is not about a relationship with with Christ, faith now means a body of teaching that makes up the Christian religion. That is the faith, seeing Titus 1.13. Same word, different meaning. But hold on a minute. I said, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. That just isn't true. Paul mostly does use the word faith in the manner that Bart says, but at times he also does use it to refer to a body of doctrine in his undisputed letters. Here are some examples. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, stand firm in the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, examine yourselves and see whether you are in the faith. And in Philippians 1, 27, he says that they should be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Aaron is just plain wrong to suggest that Paul doesn't use different shades of meaning when he's referring to the word faith. He doesn't always use faith in a wooden manner that only has one definition. So far, I have to say the sauce is tasting pretty weak, but let's give Dr. Ehrman another chance. Bart's final objection has to do with church hierarchy. He says that this probably is the biggest problem with accepting the pastorals as coming from Paul. Okay, so now we're finally getting to the tough stuff. He writes, the one thing Paul does not do is write to the leaders at the church of Corinth and tell them to get their parishioners in order. Why is that? Because there were no leaders at the church of Corinth. There were no bishops and deacons. There were no pastors. There was a group of individuals, each of whom had a gift of the Spirit in this brief time before the end came. Contrast that with what you have in the pastorals. Here you do not have individuals endowed by the Spirit working together to form the community. Here you have the pastors, Timothy and Titus. You have the church leaders, bishops and deacons. You have hierarchy, structure organization. That is to say, you have a different historical situation than you had in the days of Paul. That's it? That's the biggest problem? Sorry, but this argument from pecking order strikes me as patently false. In Paul's undisputed letters, there are offices of overseers and deacons. Paul opens up his letter to the Philippians, and it mentions to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Here the word overseer and bishop are basically interchangeable. And while not also as explicit, Paul also does mention that the Thessalonians had church leaders. He writes, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. He also states in Romans that there are those who are gifted to lead, and he mentions specific church leaders.
appears in other places, like in Romans 16.1 and 1 Corinthians 16.15-17. If this is the strongest objection against the genuineness of the pastoral epistles, I have to say, I'm not all that impressed. So we've looked at Ehrman's case against the pastorals, now let's look at a positive case for Pauline authorship. First, let's consider the external evidence. New Testament scholar Kenneth Birding notes that Polycarp is the very first church father to quote from 1 Timothy, and he's writing around AD 110. Birding argues that Polycarp clusters quotations from the pastorals together with others from the uncontested letters after explicitly mentioning Paul's name. This clearly shows belief in Paul's authorship. So for example, in chapters 3 and 4 of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, after referring to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul, Polycarp pulls from two undisputed Pauline epistles, Galatians and 2 Corinthians. Sandwiched between these two references are two passages from 1 Timothy. Polycarp writes that the love of money is the root of all evils, 1 Timothy 6.10, and as we brought nothing into the world so we can carry nothing out, 1 Timothy 6.7. And besides, Irenaeus explicitly mentions that Paul is the author of the pastor oral letters, writing at around 180 AD. He was Polycarp's student, and he tells us that Polycarp knew some of the original apostles. And we know that Polycarp is familiar with Paul's death as he writes about it. The pastorals are also cited approvingly by the Didache, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Origen. So the external evidence is actually quite strong. Let's take a look at the internal evidence. If you're forging a letter from someone and you want to make it believable, you're going to color it with some overt connections with their previous letters and life details. Some critics say that this exists when the writer of Timothy talks about Paul's former life as a church persecutor, but there are some less obvious interconnections between Acts in the pastorals that seem very unlikely to be intentional. These point to Paul being the genuine author of the letters and come in the form of undesigned coincidences. So what in the world is an undesigned coincidence? An undesigned coincidence was named by J.J. Blunt and first popularized by William Paley. New Testament scholar Peter J. Williams defines them like this. In an undesigned coincidence, Writers show agreement of a kind that is hard to imagine as deliberately contrived by either author to make the story look authentic. Philosopher Lydia McGrew has recently revived this older argument in her fantastic book, Hidden in Plain View. Here I'll be drawing from her book, and I'll be sure to link it in the description. The first undesigned coincidence is about Timothy himself. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. 2 Timothy 3.15 gives us more details about Timothy's upbringing, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So we read that Timothy was very much steeped in the Jewish faith. These details fit well together with what we read in Acts 16, 1 through 3, which reads, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in these places places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So in Acts, we learn Timothy's father was Greek, but apparently drew the line at circumcision, but his mother was a Jewish convert to Christianity. So that's why he would have been familiar with the scriptures ever since he was a child. Second Timothy mentions his grandmother, but not his father. Neither group of details seems to be really in connection with one another. Regarding this undesigned coincidence, McGrew writes, If the account in Acts were based on 2 Timothy, it seems quite unlikely that the author would have refrained from mentioning the name of Timothy's mother or his grandmother mentioned so conveniently in the epistle. This undesigned coincidence has the ring of truth. Timothy's father was a Greek and his mother was Jewish. He was raised from childhood in the knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, and both the author of 2 Timothy and the author of Acts knew about him and described him accurately. The second undesigned coincidence has to do with Timothy's familiarity with Paul's trial. 2 Timothy 3.10-11 through 11 says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. This raises a very interesting question. Paul went through a lot of persecutions, so why particularly mention Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra as the ones that Timothy would have been familiar with? In Acts 16.1, we read that Timothy was known as a believer when Paul came to Derby and Lystra, but both cities are near Iconium, so Timothy must have been from one of them. In the run-up to these verses, Acts gives us the rundown of the persecution Paul received on his first missionary journey, which happens to be in Antioch, Iconium, 
and then Lystra. Paul was stoned and thought for dead in Lystra, and surely word got around about this event, and it must have made quite an impression on a young believer like Timothy. Furthermore, Paul calls Timothy his beloved child, suggesting that he played a role in him becoming a Christian. McGrew sums up this undesigned coincidence as follows. Notice how indirect all of this is. One infers from 2 Timothy that Paul had some special reason to mention those persecutions to Timothy and to say they were known to Timothy. One notes the point in Acts 13 through 14 where the narrative describes persecutions in these towns. One then infers from Acts 16 that Timothy was already a disciple from that region and had been converted during Paul's previous visit to the region described in Acts 13 through 14, during which the persecutions took place. Again, it's doubtful that either the author of Acts or 2 Timothy are deliberately adding little plausible details that they hope will satisfy readers of their genuineness. Phony details would surely be more obvious and not so dependent on inference. Rather, the undesigned coincidences between them show that the sender and the sendee of 2 Timothy are most likely the same Paul and Timothy we read about in Acts. Finally, it's hard to fit the personal anecdotes found in the pastorals into a framework imagined by those who see them as forgeries. Why should we read about Paul's cloak? and his scrolls, or about him leaving Timothy in Ephesus when he went to Macedonia, or Paul's wish to come to Timothy shortly, but with no assurance that he wouldn't be delayed. Or what's the point of saying Onesiphorus searched for Paul in Rome and found him, or that he left Trophimus in Miletus sick, or that he was planning to winter in Nicopolis? Or what about the advice, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses? I mean, imagine a forger sitting down to write something like this in the name of Paul, so completely remote of doctrine or instruction regarding the church. No plausible reason has been proposed for inventing these hypothetical scenarios. I have to say, Airman's forgery case is just, well, not very compelling at all, if I'm honest, and the internal and external evidence for the pastorals is very solid. And if scholars think that the pastorals are obviously not Pauline based on such flimsy arguments, then why should we trust them when they tell us that Paul didn't write Ephesians or Colossians or 2 Thessalonians? This just goes to show that we shouldn't uncritically put our faith in the scholarly consensus. We need to do our own homework and think for ourselves.